Hi, welcome to the Zero Waste Scotland podcast on change management. My name's Jackie Smith and today I'm going to be exploring with you how we can use change management to help you embed carbon management within your organisation. What we'd like to do today is give you a set of knowledge and tools that you can use to help drive carbon management. So the first thing we'll do is we'll look at how you can develop a change management plan, which will give you the techniques to help you to get people to understand and commit to your carbon management plan. And then how you can use that throughout the process of building your carbon management plan and successfully implementing it. So we're going to start today with just having an understanding of what we mean by the term change management. We'll look at how change actually impacts upon people and we'll show you different tools and techniques that you can use to help you on the journey. And finally, we hope by the end of today you've got some confidence that you can go out there and achieve success. So the structure of the podcast is going to be, first of all, we'll talk about change management. We'll then talk about the change curve and that's how change actually impacts upon people. We'll then explore what happens if you decide to completely ignore change management and the impacts it will have. We'll talk about all the different stages of change and we'll look at some change management tools that you can use. And then finally at the end, we'll give you a list of resources that you can go and look up in your own time and adapt to your own uses. So, what's change management? Well, change management itself is actually a process with a set of tools and techniques that can help you to manage the people side of change and make sure you get the desired benefits and outcomes. Change impacts upon people in different ways and it's to help you to get people to make a successful transition from the start point that they're in just now to the change state that you want them to have. And more importantly, it's to make sure that that change you're embedding actually sticks. There's no good setting up a travel management plan, for example, encouraging people to use buses if you don't actually monitor and measure it. Because what might happen is at the start when it's public, there's lots of communication, people will start using it. And then gradually over time, they'll slip back into the bad old ways. So you need to make sure that you're monitoring things to make sure that the changes you put in live with you throughout the programme. So what do you think when you hear that term change management? Is it one of those things where you think, oh, no, that's just upheaval, disruption. I just don't want to be involved in this. Or you might think when people say change management, oh, yeah, that's communications. We just talk to people about it. Or... You might think, oh, it's all that fluffy stuff, you know, the let's have meetings with people and explore how they're feeling about it. Or you might think it's just a big, long checklist of deliverables. Well, if we just tick the boxes, that's change management. So if you thought it was upheaval and disruption, maybe your thoughts were change management's that thing that comes along and it actually stops me from doing my day job. It makes me take time out of my day to go on silly training courses and to have silly meetings that I don't see the point of. And it takes my colleagues away, which means we can't get the job done. And also it upsets people. So really, change management, that's just all upheaval and disruption. But actually, change management's there to minimise the upset and the disruption It's there if you use it to help plot the progress so that you can understand the thoughts that are going through people's heads, the feelings they have, and make sure the things you put in place to help them are done so understanding their existing workplace. So you don't, for example, schedule a training course with every member of staff in one area, knowing that the month end is their busiest time. Now, there's always going to be time that you're going to need to take out to manage change management and actually move your projects forward. But if you do it properly, the aim is not to disrupt people. It's actually to help them with a smooth transition. Also, if you thought it was just communications, 
communications, if people are leading from the front, right, let's go do this. Yes, sir, let's go do it. But actually, that's not what people are really hearing with communications. You might be putting messages out using email or presentations, but you're basically giving out the message, we're going to reach our carbon reduction target by implementing a zero waste policy in our organisation. Now, what you haven't taken into account is what the listeners are actually interpreting with that communication. Some might be thinking, actually, that's not the best way to do it. Most of our carbon's in travel, so shouldn't we be hitting the travel target? Or you might have somebody that's thinking, well, that's all well and good that we're not going to have any waste. We're going to recycle everything. But what do I do with my coffee filters out of my coffee pot? How do I deal with them? You might have some people that think, I just don't understand all of this. Why is this important to our organisation? Why do we want to be doing this? And you might get people who think, you know what? That's just nothing to do with my job. That's not my problem. I'm not interested. Now, communication itself isn't change management because communication doesn't always generate understanding. You may think you are giving people very clear messages on ways to do things, but that's not always the way they're going to interpret them. Also, people don't rush into action just because you've communicated with them. So you won't automatically gain somebody's commitment to the programme that you want to carry out just because you've communicated with them. But it is a useful tool for change management. So it is one that should be in your kit bag to be used. Also, if you thought that it was just all that fluffy stuff, maybe you think, well, it might be better just to tell people to do it. You don't need all that fluffy rubbish. Just tell them to adopt it and get on with it. But the actual fluffy stuff, in other words, the people side of change is really, really important because you need to give people the, the tools to be able to cope with the change. Just telling them to get on with it might forget the fact that they don't actually know how to do it. So you might have to train them to give them new ways of working. Also, if you don't engage people with a process, they don't buy into it. So if you simply tell somebody that we're now going to be turning all the lights off at five o'clock at night. They might think, well, I don't know why you want to do that. I'm working late tonight. I'll just turn everything in the entire office back on again. And also you need to gather opinions and feedback and value what people are telling you. People may have a very good reason why the plans you want to put in place may not work for their circumstances or the type of work that you do. And if you have that discussion with them, you can actually work out the best approach to take and the best way to move things forward. So the fluffy stuff's actually quite a useful tool. And if you thought change management was just a big long checklist of actions, right, have we ticked that off? Have we done the training? Yes, tick, that's done. That change will move in perfectly. Well, a checklist of actions doesn't necessarily mean it's the right actions that you're adopting. Also, if it's just a checklist, have you actually considered who is going to be impacted by the change you're looking at? And are you doing the right actions to target those people? And finally, if it's just a checklist of actions, how do you know if the actions have actually worked? Have they achieved the outcome that you're looking for? So change management is an organised approach. There is an element of a consistent structure that you can follow. But actually it's there not to be a tick box exercise. It's actually there to demonstrate to people that you're serious about it. You want this to work. You want your carbon management plan to reduce the carbon emissions of your business. You actually want people to change to a new way of working. And it makes sure that you target all the initiatives that you need to make it happen for you. But making change happen involves actually breaking with the status quo because that's what change is. It's not doing the same things the same way as we've always done them before. It's actually mixing things up a bit. 
But in order to do that, you've got to give people the right abilities and skills to cope with that change that you're putting in. And that means making sure that you've given them the training, you've actually discussed the change process with them, and you've given them time to adapt to that change. And the most important thing to remember, it's actually people that do the change, not your organisation. So you could decide you have an absolutely amazing change management plan and you've built a carbon management plan with lots of individual projects in it that are going to make a huge reduction to your carbon emissions. But unless the people in your organisation actually implement those projects, you're not going to make your targets. So you need to remember changes about people, not just your organisation. So let's look at the change curve. Change itself is actually a structured approach. We all go through it in life. Um, and there is a great fear of change. People don't like change. They hate it. They'll resist it. They'll do everything in their power not to change because it's comfortable to do the things you've always done before. It means you don't have to think about it when you get up in the morning. Yep, I know what I'm doing. I go into work. I do it that way. That makes things so much happier. But ultimately, change is an inevitable part of life. No matter what line of work you're in, no matter what lifestyle you've got, change will come along and impact on you. And actually, the only way to, to succeed in the world is to be able to cope with change. Now, change itself is a process. The current state you're in, that's, that's the easy place to be. I know exactly where I am. I know I get up in the morning. I know I go to work. When you're in transition where people are telling you that actually your whole world's about to change, you're no longer going to get in your car and drive to work. You're going to walk to the bus stop. You're going to get in the bus and then you're going to walk from the other end to the bus to your office. People start to get a bit stressed about that because they start to think, well, I don't actually know the bus timetable. I don't know which bus to get what happens if the bus is late what what happens if the bus breaks down on the way and until they actually get to their future state where they've got on the bus they've got to work successfully they're not really sure how it's all going to work for them so it's very unknown to them and that can be stressful for people when they don't have the experience to know how that will work now, there's a, a wonderful guy um, called Kubler and Ross who developed what's called the change curve. And the change curve explains the different states that people go through when they're making a transition to a new way of working or it could be a new lifestyle change. So the first thing that people tend to do when they're told that something's going to happen is they actually go into shock. So they might suddenly be surprised, well, what do you mean I'm not allowed to drive to work anymore? Why have I got to take the bus? I didn't know that was coming. So they're, they're shocked because they didn't anticipate the change coming. Then you tend to go into denial. So you look for evidence that actually, did I read that right? No, maybe I didn't. Maybe it's an April Fool's. No, maybe I don't have to do that. And they start to go back through looking for evidence. Why, why didn't I realise this change was coming? And they might go through their email trails. They might talk to their colleagues. Then people start to get into frustration. And that's a recognition that things are going to be different. And sometimes people react angrily to that because they feel as if they had no control over the change. So they start to get angry. Well, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't understand that. There's no way I'm going to do that. Then, when time goes on, some people become depressed about it. It actually impacts their motivation. So they find they've got a low mood or they're lacking in energy because they're beginning to think, well, I didn't want to do this. I'm not really happy about it, so I can't see how I can do it. So I'll just, if I don't think about it, it'll maybe go away. Maybe it'll just all disappear and, and I can get on with life and they'll change their mind. Then as time goes on, people gradually start to experiment and explore. So they actually start to think, well, 
if I have to do this, how could I do it? M maybe I could look up the bus timetable. Maybe at the weekend I could walk and find the bus stop. So they start to explore different ways that, that they could actually do this. And then people make a decision. They actually decide, you know what? Yes, I'm going to do this. Okay, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to do this. I'll go and learn all about it. And they start to feel more positive about it. And then finally, they start to integrate with the change. So the change becomes part of them. And they actually have decided that it's the way forward. They're going to do it. And they start doing it. And then that gets them back into a positive frame of mind. So as you can see, the change curve actually gets people, they have to work through all those thoughts and feelings to get to a point where they're ready to adapt and cope with the change. And from a business perspective, you'll find that the first time people are told about a change, their actual motivation and their performance at work will dip. So when you're deciding that you're going to change your travel policy at work and you're going to impact a whole group of people, for example, you have to think about the fact that you need to give them time to work that through. And change management is all about giving them the tools to get through the change curve faster so that they have all the information, they have enough time to talk to each other, they can talk about their confusion, their uncertainty, so that you can get them through the change curve quicker to get them to the point where they're going to accept that this change is going to happen. Now, not everybody will be committed to a change. In other words, not everybody will be really excited about it and desperate to do it. But as long as you can get people to accept the change, then they will move on and actually start to do work differently the way you need them and want them to work. So why do people actually change? What forces them to make that change? Well, they have to see the need for the change. So you have to be able to communicate with people why you are actually doing the things you are doing. And the best way to communicate with them is on an individual level. Carbon management is a difficult concept to get across to some people because they don't see it as being an impact on them or being their problem. So you need to try and translate it into their behaviours and the way they think about the world. You also have to give them the tools to let them know how to make the change. Just by telling somebody we're going to implement this, you have to do it, doesn't mean they actually know how to do it. And change can be painful. And it's not always the thing that person wants to do. So you have to get them actively involved. You have to tell them how they're going to change and give them the tools and techniques and give them a bit of security in making that change because it's unsettling for people to change, but if you can help them to understand the why, the how, and it'll be all right, we'll get you through it, people will start to move. The other thing is, if you're changing somebody's behaviours and attitudes, that will take longer. To change the process that somebody uses at work for the way they do their job can be a more manual process where you say to them we're going to switch to electronic now so you've not got so much paper involved people can begin to see the benefits of that and may adjust to that faster when you're actually saying to somebody we need you to change the whole way you think about work you need to think about what you're doing to the environment that's harder for them because it's something that's built into them as a person rather than just the organization a major change happens when people feel that they have lost control over some important aspects of their life or their environment. A major change is difficult to drive through because you have to give people sufficient time to cope with it. And the goal of change management is to help them to make that transition. So whatever you're trying to implement in your carbon management plan, you have to actually think about the impact it will have on the people you're working with and what the scale of the impact will be. Is it the entire organisation you're looking at or is it one department or one area? And you have to build your change management plan to cope with that. So what happens if, if you decide I'm not actually going to bother with change management? 
I don't think it's important. I don't have the time or the money for it. And actually, my carbon management plan is going to run beautifully without it. Well, what I would say to you is you really are causing problems. I'm sure you've all experienced a change that's been imposed in your organisation that wasn't implemented very well. You might have felt upset and angry or worse, you might actually have decided I'm not going to make that change. 70% of transformations in organisations fail if there's no change management involved. The biggest barrier that people list to project success is all the people factors. It's being able to change people's mindsets and their attitudes. It's being able to adopt a corporate culture. And if there's a lack of senior management support for the change, it's got a really high failure rate. Another thing is if you're implementing something that you need a return on investment, in other words, you, you're going to make a serious project investment, not only to release carbon management benefits, but also to release financial benefits. If you don't have a change management program, your chances of achieving your benefits in terms of financial benefits drops dramatically. It actually, from Cotter International worked out, it goes from 143% down to 35%, which means your finance people are not going to be very happy with you. And there is a correlation between change management activities and actually projects being successful and implementing successfully. This diagram is from a company called ProSci, who developed change management practices and methods and what it's basically showing you is when you implement a change management program even if it's a fair change management program you start to get to the point where you're going to meet your project objectives when you get into delivering an excellent change management program you could well exceed your project objectives so it's worthwhile thinking about it not only from the success rate point of view but also from the financial point of view. The other thing to remember as well, regardless of what project or programme you're putting in place, when you start to implement a project, you spend all the money up front in terms of the project implementation curve because you have to pay for all the activities that you're doing. But before you get any benefits from your project, there is going to be a time lag because your implementation will happen, then people need a chance to change the way they work. So there will be a dip in their efficiency until they've caught up. And then eventually you'll start to realise the benefits of the project. If you can use change management, you can start to reduce the benefit lag. In other words, you can help people to catch up quicker with the new ways of working which means they start to become efficient far earlier and you start to reach your carbon management targets far earlier. There's an interesting quote from the Carbon Management Trust that there are over 300 million opportunities in encouraging employees to ad adopt greener behaviours. But interestingly, you need a good programme to bring not only the technical expertise of the ways to do it, but you also need to think about behavioural psychology because people need to know why they're changing and they need to be persuaded with the benefits so that they will make that change. So although we could easily say, oh yeah, there's loads of opportunities out there, if we don't structure it properly and work together, we are not going to achieve them. This is... For behavioural change, it's really interesting. Again, the Carbon Trust did a survey and they realised that when they talked to people about WebExing and conference calls, 74% of people said, yeah, I'd actually replace a face-to-face -face meeting with a video conference. But in reality, only 17% of them were actually doing it. So although people said they would be happy to do it, Nobody had actually adopted the practice. Similarly, when they talked to people about energy efficiency, a lot of people, 92%, were really concerned about it at home. 
because they pay the bills, they see the impact of it. But when they were asked about it at work, only 47% were actually concerned about it. They didn't see how it impacted on them at work. Interestingly as well, 22% of employees were confident that they knew what actions to take to save energy at work. So for example, they knew that they should turn off their PC when they left. They knew they should make sure the lights were switched off. But only 16% were actually sure they had the authority to do it. Whereas at home, they would instantly have thought, it's too hot in here, I'll turn down the heating. At work, it wasn't considered their role to be able to do that. Also, people were saying they would be more likely to save energy at work if they were actually praised about it rather than criticised. So people don't like being criticised or told off for bad behaviour, but they do like being praised for good behaviour. So why should you adopt a change management approach? Well, we've just talked about the change curve and basically that's showing that resistance to change is completely normal. It's a normal psychology. It's a normal way people cope. So doing nothing about change isn't actually an option. So if you don't put things in place, change can actually result in lower performance rather than improved performance because people never make their way through the change curve. So they don't actually get to the point where they accept the change and they implement it successfully. Also, if your level of change is significant, in other words, you're going to implement six major projects in a very short period of time, you have to be careful that you don't overload people. A lot of organisations I speak to, people complain, well, we've just gone through a merger, we've got a new chief executive, we've got a new vision, we don't actually know where we're heading and now we're being asked to do this on top. Change is happening at a far faster pace than it did in the past and you have to help people to cope with it, but to cope with it in a planned method. So you need to consider how many areas of the organisation are being hit with different change initiatives at one time and help them to plan for them. You need to think about your organisation as a whole as well and you need to coordinate change across it. So it's getting an appreciation of what other departments and areas are planning to do in the next six months and making sure that your change management plans tie in with them so that you're not overloading one area. And finally, for me, one of the really important things is if you manage to get successful, tangible change, you will get tangible benefits. If you can change the way people behave and they their values and their working practices, you will get the benefits out that you originally assumed you were going to get. So what, what happens in change management, this wonderful thing we've spoken about where people adopt a new way of working? Well, there's different change characteristics we have to think about. And there are stages of good change management now, there's lots and lots of different methodologies out there for change management. And I've put in the notes section at the back some of them for you to look up. So there's methodologies such as Cotter's methodology. There's ProSize methodology. But to be honest with you, they all go through similar stages and follow roughly the same path. They all start with people needing to understand the change itself. So knowing exactly what is it you are going to implement in the organisation, how many people is it going to affect and how long do you think this process will take. You then need to create an awareness within the organisation that this change is going to happen and you've actually got to create a sense of urgency. People have to understand why this change is important so that they're ready to actually work with you on it. You need to gain stakeholder support and buy-in. So you actually need to understand who your stakeholders are. In other words, 
who are the people that are going to be impacted by this change? How are they going to feel about this change? And which are the most important ones you need to buy into the change that you want to make? Then you have to give people the ability to make that change and that involves giving them the right tools. It may be they need special training. It may be they need help with working together with new groups. Whatever it is, you've got to plan for that so that they've got the knowledge and the ability to then put that change in place. And then finally, and the one that most people forget about is, you have to make the change stick. Just because you've written a brand new carbon management plan and published it on the web doesn't mean that people are actually going to read it and adopt the new ways of working that you want them to have. So let's look at this process step by step and explore the things you have to do within it. So first of all, understanding the change. For your carbon management plan and the projects that you've got within it, you have to understand the impact of each of the projects you want to put in place. So you have to understand what size is this project? Is the scope going to affect a small part of my organisation or the entire organisation? Is it a difficult one to put in place? Is it going to involve lots of system changes? Is it going to involve lots of behavioural changes? And how long is this project going to take? And what effort do I think it's going to take to make it work? You've got to have a complete understanding of the project and the change so that you can start to work out the best way to help people through the change. Another really good factor to consider is your organisation's previous change experiences. Are you good at doing new projects? Are you good at implementing things and people adopting them and moving forwards? Because if you have a poor track record at change management, you need to put more effort in for your change management to succeed. Because you might get those wonderful phrases you hear from people. Yeah, we tried that about a year and a half ago. Didn't really work. Nah, not interested in that. Whereas actually you want people to say, oh, this is a new thing coming along. Right, I'll try it. I'll go for that. The other thing you need to understand is what else is going on within your organisation currently. So what levels of change are you asking people to cope with at the moment? Remember I talked about change overload a few minutes ago. This is where an organisation tries to put too much effort into various projects and programmes and people can't actually get on with their day jobs because they're swamped with new things they're being asked to do. So you have to bear that in mind with your projects as to is this the right timing for this one? Can people adopt it successfully? And really importantly with all of your changes, knowing who your stakeholders are. And that's everybody from your management team to the people that are impacted to the change and also it may be people external to your organisation. It might actually be your customers. It might be your suppliers. But you have to think about all the people that could be impacted. A good way to look at it is the risk of doing a change. If you've got an organisation that's been quite change resistant in the past, um, you may have had really poor experiences of implementing change and you've decided you're going to go for a really large disruptive program where you're going to implement an entire carbon management policy in one go within the first six months. If you try and do that within a change resistant organisation, you're going to be straight away into the high risk box, which means any change management effort you put in will have to be of a really high quality, high value to help lower that risk level. Whereas if your organisation is quite flexible, they're really good at coping with change and you're not proposing anything major at the moment, it's a small change to them, that'll be low risk with a really high success rate. What you want to be doing is trying to get a balance within your carbon management plans of the types of projects that you're looking for. So some of your projects might be, for example, boiler replacements, 
in which case that would impact one area, one boiler, so it's probably lower risk. Whereas if you're trying to impact, if you're trying to implement a project which is changing the entire travel policy of your entire organization and you're going to ban the use of private cars then that could be deemed to be high risk because it's large it's disruptive and people will be it's the entire organization you're trying to cope with so you've understood your change you know what risk levels you're looking at for the different types of projects you want to look at how do you then create a sense of awareness and get people, actually, we need to do this and we need to do it now? Really importantly, it's understanding, you now understand the changes you want to make, but what you need to do is you need to be able to explain to other people what those changes are and why they are needed. And a good thing to do as well is be able to explain the risks of not changing. If we do not do this, we will not meet our targets. We may have, have a financial penalty. So it's being able to explain to people the areas they need to think about and why it is really, really important to be changing. Also, it's being able to explain to them how it will impact them personally and what benefits it will give them personally. Because if you can create that awareness about it, if people understand that this change has to happen, it has to happen because if we don't do it, this is what's going to happen to the organisation. But more importantly, if I don't do it, this is what could happen to my job or my organisation or the whole way our company works. And that's creating that awareness. You've then got to gain your stakeholder support. So you have to be able to work with people to understand as a stakeholder, do I think this change is a threat to me or do I actually see it as a really good opportunity? The ones that see it as a really good opportunity can then act as change champions for you because they can help you to work with the people that see it as a threat and help to explain and explore with them how it could be implemented successfully. You've also got to understand people's personal situations. Sometimes people react badly to a change you want to make and you can't understand why because they've always worked well at work but there could be things happening in their personal life which could impact on it. So for example, if, if you wanted to switch everybody to public transport, maybe someone has real problems with childcare and they have to drop children off and the times don't work well with the buses and, and their childcare problems. So you need to start to be able to explore with them how you could implement it so that it works in their personal situation. And you've got to give people some level of motivation to want to do things. And when you're changing people, you've got to be able to remove the change barriers. Some people will have real barriers to why they can't do something and others it will just be because they think they can't do it. But you've got to understand that in order to be able to remove them. So it's working with people, talking to them, gaining feedback, not just talking at them so that you can understand what are the levels of support they actually need. Is it training? Is it new skills they need? Is it advanced warning that something's going to happen? Or is it more a personal thing? For example, the one I quoted earlier, do we maybe need to change their working hours so that we could make sure they could still get into work and do their hours? but they're not impacted by the time they've got to take to drop their children off before they get the bus. So it's thinking your way through it. And once you've implemented the change, you've actually got to make it stick. The number of times people implement a project and they walk away and they go back to it six months later and discover that actually the staff weren't that keen on it in the first place. So do you know what? Instead of using the communal recycling bins at the bottom of the office, they've all started bringing in personal little bins which they've popped under their office desk and they use them instead. So you've got to think about how you could stop the change from slipping backwards, how you can stop people reverting back to the old behaviour. 
And you can do that in lots of different ways. You can do it with positive reinforcement. That's actually working really well. Tell people, we implemented this, the results so far have been this, we've achieved this much. And actually for the people who are completely resistant, you maybe need to take more stronger methods, individual discussions with them. Why aren't they doing it? We need to stop them from going back to the old ways. And we need to celebrate for people demonstrate that the work we've been doing actually makes a difference and these are the achievements we've managed to make. So the change management process then, as we've talked through, is all about preparing for the change. So that's all about understanding what projects you're going to implement, being able to define who it's going to impact and building a team of people to make sure you've got enough resources to help you to impact it. Then we're going to manage the change. So we're going to implement our change management plans. We're going to make sure that we're having an impact. So if we're communicating pe with people, what was the feedback on that communication? Did people understand the message? Are they ready to adopt it? How did the training go? Make sure you get feedback at the end of training sessions. Adjust your training if it's not hitting the mark. And then finally, we've got to reinforce the change. So to make the change stick, we actually have to make sure that we've reinforced it as we go. So we've gone through the entire change management process. What about the change tools that we would actually use to make it happen? So what do I mean by change tools? Well, in your kit bag, you've got lots of different tools and techniques that you can use to help you drive forwards. And one of the most important ones for me is sponsorship. If you're implementing a carbon management plan, you should have someone in your senior team who's going to be there to act as your sponsor. And when I say sponsor, I mean somebody that actually is willing to engage. So in other words, they don't just sign their name to the bit of paper. They're the person that at meetings actually says, now remember in our change management plan, we're going to reduce this emission. They're the one that's out there as your figurehead promoting your projects. And they're the one that want the desired result as much as you do. So senior sponsorship is really important to drive messages forward. You need proper communications. And we've talked about communications earlier. So it's not always just push communications. In other words, I'm going to tell you a message. I'm going to send you an email. It's actually gaining feedback from those communications too. We need coaching. So we need to be able to speak to people on an individual basis and help them through the change. And finally, we need proper structured training to get people ready to cope with the change. So let's look at these tools one by one and work out when you can use them and the different elements to consider when you're thinking about them. So sponsorship. Since your organisation can't change unless your people change, you really need an active sponsor. It's an interesting fact, but certain communication messages, if a lower member of staff tells people to change, they often will ignore the message. Whereas if the message comes from a senior leader and manager, they will actually make that change and they'll be keen to do so. So you need a sponsor at a senior level to give out the top messages, but also you need them to corral all the other senior managers. So you need someone that can build a coalition and actually drive other management behavior. Employees look to senior leaders for messages. And if you've got somebody senior on board, they'll actually take that as meaning the organization is committed to this change. The other thing is your senior managers generally hold the budgets for things. So again, if you've got a senior manager as your sponsor, he's able to talk to the decision makers and the budget holders and get them to commit to the, the change management and the carbon management plans you want to do. And the employees need to see that it's been led from the top. 
So you need to find yourself a good sponsor and you need to help them to understand how important it is that they actively engage in the project. Now there's all sorts of methods of communication out there that you can use and I would strongly recommend that you mix them up quite a bit. A lot of organisations I've worked with tend to use the same communication tools day in, day out. So one organisation, for example, thinks that emailing everybody on a Monday is the best way of getting messages out. What happens? A Monday morning, people come in, they see the email, they instantly put it in their dump box because they think, oh, it's just that boring communication stuff. So they've become immune to it. They don't read it anymore. So you can look at different methods of communication. You can do emails, not always that effective. You can do group sessions where you get people together to talk about the changes you're going to make. And they're really useful because it's a two-way form of communication. You can get active feedback as well as just pushing your messages out. You can do podcasts like this one, where you actually record somebody speaking and giving video messages. One organisation I worked with actually loved the fact that for the first time ever they'd had a video message from a senior manager because they had no idea what he looked like. They'd never met the guy before. You might decide to design posters. These can be quite effective when you're trying to do things like waste management programmes because you can actually put them up next to your bins so that people can see, all oh, right, that's, that's new, and they get information about it while they're doing it. You might decide to do little drop-in sessions, one-to-ones, where you arrange with people, we'll do a, a coffee session. If people have a normal coffee break, I'll be there at that coffee break twice a week. You can speak to me about the programme. You might actually arrange your own little mini newsletter, or your organisation might have a newsletter that you can use. And if you're lucky, and you've got a carbon network within your organisation, that is a perfect way of communicating with people because you use your people in the carbon network to get your messages out, but you also get the feedback from them as to what everybody is saying on the ground. Now, a lot of your organisations will have a communications officer or a communications manager, and it's a really good thing to sit down with them when you're developing your carbon management plans and explain to them what you're doing explain to them how important it is that you need help with the communications and ask them to give you the best suggestions for the ways of talking to people because they're there to help you. Another good thing to think about is, is coaching and this tends to get forgotten about in change management because people tend to focus on the large scale things they can do across the board like communications we've just talked about, or training. Coaching is more tailored support. And in your organisation, you will generally find that people have regular meetings with their managers. Now, it might not be called a coaching session. It might be a leadership session, or it might be a general work session. But they're a good opportunity to talk to people about the change that's going to be made, understanding any obstacles they've got to making that change and helping to remove them. And if you've got your managers who have these regular meetings, it would be really good to give them briefings beforehand to tell them the areas that might concern people and how to overcome those objections and also give them some tools and techniques in terms of coaching and mentoring. Now we've talked about training quite a bit and again, you don't have to adopt classroom training for everything. It depends on the type of change that you're going to make. Again, it can be good to mix up your training methods. You might want to do individual training with people. You might want to give people training notes so that if they're not sure about something, it's there for them. You might want to do like this, podcasts or webcast training. Make sure you mix it up again because depending on the type of project you're trying to do, different types of training are required. So if you're trying to change people's behaviour and culture, 
you will generally find that face-to-face -face training is a good way of doing that because people get a chance to think about things and give feedback, whereas podcasts are very talk at training rather than interact with training. So think about the training method you might adopt. And then finally, we come on to resistance management. Now, not everyone is going to want to adopt a change. It's a fact of life. You will never persuade 100% of your people that this is the change they want to make. They'll be committed and they're happy about it. There will always be one or two people in your organisation who will resist it to the bitter end. And rather than ignore that fact, it's worth thinking about it and thinking about the ways to overcome it. So one thing you can do is when you've identified people, individuals or groups who are resisting the change is meet with them so that you can listen to them and understand why. You can help them to focus on what needs to change and why they have to do it. And in some cases, it's not just, well, it's for the benefit of the whole organisation. In some cases, you have to actually provide clear choices and consequences. In other words, if you refuse to implement this travel policy, I am afraid that is an HR issue. Not everything is a touchy-feely change management element. Some things are hard facts and the organisation has to implement them. That's the rules. It may be legislative, in which case, if the organisation does not implement it, it could be up for a fine or punishment. And you have to explain that to people. You have, however, to understand where the problems lie. And it might be their particular barriers that they can't overcome, in which case you need to work with them to overcome those barriers. And you have to sell the benefits of a programme. You're never going to get 100% of people to actually be happy about the change. But what you need to get is the people who will implement it. They might not be happy about it, but they have to move forwards with the change. So don't forget about resistance management. It's really, really important because if you don't start to tackle it from an early stage, people may undercut or undersell or go back to the old ways of doing things. So we've talked through different methods of change tools. So what's the best time to actually use them? Well, if we think about the change process that we talked about, when we're at the start of the change process and we're trying to get people to understand what the change is all about so they're aware of it, they know what's happening and they know when it's happening, that's a good time to use your communications. It's a good time to use your sponsor. They've got to be actively driving it forwards. And it's a good time to start using coaching so that you use individual sessions to people so that you get a sense of urgency. When you're at the stage when you've got to get stakeholder support and buy-in, this is when really you should have your sponsor leading from the front, out there getting the messages across, talking to the people that might see it as a problem area. You should be doing lots of active communication with people and actually you should be starting to flag up if there's areas where certain stakeholders might be resistant. So start to work with them early on in the process so that you get it to move forwards. When people need the abilities to implement the change, this is when your training comes in. So you need to be able to provide the right level of training to people just before the implementation so they know how to actually use the new methods you've adopted or be able to work with them. And again, in this one, it's a point where you want to be thinking about coaching and supporting people through the change. And finally, when you want to make the change stick, actually, you need to use all your change management tools and techniques. But resistance management is the key one at the front. And it might use coaching to help with certain individuals. It might use communications to drive through those celebratory messages 
and it might use your sponsor again to be telling people this is important we need it to work we need things to move forwards so those are all your different tools and when you can use them and you can mix that up but the key important thing is you've got to make sure you've got it planned so that you know when you're going to implement these things linked to the timeline of your carbon management projects and you might have one change plan for your whole carbon management plan but with individual change plans tailored to each of the projects you want to implement and finally how do you make sure that your projects are getting a fair hearing now i know at the moment there's a lot going on in your organizations you're all under a lot of stress and pressure to deliver more with less but this is where your sponsor comes into the world they should be helping you you should have created compelling business cases for each of the projects you want to implement and that helps because that gives you the benefit messages you need to communicate and you should have thought about the risks in your projects this again will help because you'll be able to explain to people if we don't do this this is what the risks are going to be also you should have thought about your level of stakeholder management and buy-in and the more people you involve at an early stage in developing your carbon management plan the easier it is to make your change actually happen and if you can start to build your projects up deliver a project successfully get that celebration message out there that starts to change the whole way the organization think they become serious then they think well actually they delivered that travel policy change that went really well oh, okay so now they want to look at video conferencing yeah we can do this we can definitely do this so you'll start to get people understanding that actually you can deliver these projects and finally you should engage with finance all the way through the process because you need their help with the budgets and the numbers that you're working with so we've talked quite a lot in the podcast about all the different change techniques and tools that you can use but there's lots and lots of wonderful additional resources out there that are worth you having a look at and what i've done is i've given you some useful sites to look up there's lots of change management methods out there you just pick the one that's suitable for you and your organization and i've also linked some good books for you and material to read and have a think about what i'd like to do is to say thank you so much for listening if you need any further information please do contact zero waste scotland and we would love to help thank you